We believe that everyone in our company, from the receptionist to people in the warehouse and everywhere in between, everyone has the ability to add credibility to our company or take credibility away. And of course, we've worked so hard for our brand that we would hate to have someone take credibility away. And so we just make sure they're really trained before they're involved with customers. Scratch Entrepreneur. True stories of remarkable people who dropped everything to turn an idea into a healthy, profitable business. I talk a lot on this show about structure and focus and systems. And They're super boring topics. Like, I totally get that. They're not the exciting marketing or the vision or the brand or the things that make your your business awesome and fun and interesting to other people, who your ideal client is and all that kind of stuff. And I love that side, too. I love talking about that side. But I truly believe that the systems inside your business are so, so important to your success. Of course you have to go out and find people and attract them to the work that you're doing or the product that you provide. But ultimately, you have to take great care of them when they get there. And if you're not doing that, then you're not getting the referrals on the back end or the people that are raving fans of your product or your service. And you don't have that snowball continuing to roll down the hill and grow and grow and grow as more and more people start to get excited about the work you're doing. Today, we're gonna talk to a business owner who has fabulous systems in his business. And that business, over the course of 40 years, has grown to a $750 million business. In the next three to five years, he projects that they will be over a billion dollar business. And they've done that by starting with passion by being into the topic, the thing that they're selling. In their case, they have products, audio products, musical products, guitars and keyboards and microphones and all those kinds of things. And he was into it from the very beginning. He'll tell his story, and it's a really, really cool one. He had a recording studio out of a VW bus. But he's grown this business using foundational systems. I have purchased uh, a lot of audio equipment from Sweetwater Sound, uh, the business that our guest owns. And as you go through that process, you get a personalized um, sales associate who checks in with you, who asks you how things are going in your process of decision making, because audio equipment is a complex world with lots of different options. And so Sweetwater Sound actually offers you people to walk through that, whether you buy from them or not. Obviously, they would love for you to buy from them, and they facilitate that process. Process. But whether you buy from them or not, they're helping you to walk through the process of deciding what you need for your specific application and purchasing the right equipment to do so. And then they check in afterwards to make sure things are going well and you're having success. And so the systems that Chuck Serac has built into his business, Sweetwater Sound, facilitate success for his customer. He does something that other people don't do. I can't go to Amazon, and he talks about Amazon. We talk about that in the conversation. I I can't go to Amazon and get advice about what mixer I need to properly set up a podcasting studio like the one I'm sitting in right now. But at Sweetwater Sound, I can. And so they have built a fabulous business on systems and passion for a specific niche product. Chuck Serac talks with me about all those topics as well as his upbringing and what makes him passionate still after 40 years about the businesses that he owns. Not only does he own Sweetwater Sound, but he has multiple other businesses as well. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and I hope you walk away understanding better how the systems inside your business are key to building a healthy, profitable business. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, this is Jeremy Goodrich, owner of Shine Insurance and your host for the Scratch Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm here today with Chuck Surak, owner of Sweetwater Sound, 
a wonderful business that I've done a ton of business with myself, building recording studios, building the podcast studio, and building much of the setup I have sitting around me right now. They provide audio equipment and music equipment to the retail space, obviously from lower end stuff all the way to the high end stuff. So Chuck, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time to chat with us today. You're very welcome, Jeremy. Glad to be here. So we start off with kind of a quick fire, just getting some cool stuff you're up to right now. And that starts off with a podcast. Do you listen to podcasts at all? I do some, but I tend to listen more to music. But there there are some podcasts, yes. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to get to music in a second. Um, But any podcast in specific that you're listening to right now, but maybe our listeners would love to connect with? Yeah, there's a new series sponsored by Synchrony, the financing company, the the bank. And uh, it's called Business Schooled with Alexis Hohanian. And the only thing I would say in, in uh, to being clear and transparent, there's actually a session he did with me last fall that's on there, but there's several other just really great lessons and all kinds of different businesses. I think there's about uh, eight or nine of these different uh, podcasts, but uh, it's called Business Schooled. Awesome. Business Schooled. Well, I like it already. I love to listen to podcasts where they're teaching me. There's sort of two categories that I get into. One is it's teaching me something. I'll do that like on the treadmill or whatever. And then others is like storytelling and really getting into some cool topic. And and I like both at different times for different reasons, you know? Sure. Okay. So let's talk music. Who is a musician that is in heavy rotation in your living room right now? I like a little bit of everything, as long as it's done well. I really do like all genres of music, but I'm a saxophone player, and uh, a group that I followed for 50 years now is a band called Tower of Power. They're out of the San Francisco area. They do kind of a rhythm and blues, soul music. It's a great band with uh, uh, several horn players, and uh, they've become friends of mine, but I listen to a lot of Tower of Power. So that brings me to the next question. If you could get on stage with, you know, any one person living or not living anymore, um, who might that person be? Wow. You know, again, as a sax player, I'm going to bring up a name that most of the listeners may not recognize. But there was a sax player who died about 10 years ago named Boots Randolph. Boots Randolph was this just amazing. I think the best sax player that's ever walked this earth. I mean, there's a lot of good ones, but Boots was a famous musician in the 60s and 70s down in Nashville. And he played on all the recording sessions, did literally thousands and thousands of, of records. The only sax player that Elvis ever recorded with. And uh, he did 50 of his own albums. And his big claim to fame was a song called Yakety Sax. And it's a comedy sort of song. And anytime you see a, a sped up video on YouTube or something, you'll hear Yakety Sax uh, playing in the background. It happens to be the ringtone on my telephone. But uh, <laughs> I, I was fortunate about 11 years ago, I played on stage with Boots. And, and uh, I'd love to have another chance to play with Boots again. I'm 10 years or 11 years better than I was then. But uh, <laughs> So Boots Randolph, who Boots Randolph, played, yes. played sax for a long time. And you did actually get to stand on stage with him. You both were sax players. How did it go back and forth? Like, how did two sax players handle each other on a stage? Yeah, well, we uh, got to play with the uh, Fort Wayne Philharmonic Orchestra. He was the feature by all means, but but I came out on stage and played a couple songs, and uh, we went back and forth trading choruses and and just having fun. He, he was a good friend, and I miss him dearly because he was just a great friend as he was an amazing saxophone player. But if you Google Boots Randolph, you'll find lots and lots of his music. Cool. All right, well, I'll do that as soon as we get done here. Okay, I want to take you backwards a little bit, back to the beginning. So you really started off as a musician, as a saxophone player, and you were on the road for a little while in the 1970s playing as a musician. Do I have that right? That is correct, yes. Okay, so in that period of time, is there a story that you look back on that a epitomizes kind of who you are or who you became. I I think all of us, no matter what it is, whether it's being a musician or being on a sports team or being in maybe the military or other types of things, when we have those moments when we're younger and we just connect with a tight group of people in whatever environment that is, it seems like it creates something that sort of builds us as a human into the future. And I wonder if there's a story that is spurred by that idea. Yeah. And for me, it would start earlier than that. My first quote unquote job, as I would call it, is I was five and six years old and I made potholders. Potholders, you put the little loops across the frame and then you crisscross them and then around the outside. And I grew up in a little town in southern Ohio called Waverly, about an hour south of Columbus. And I sold thousands and thousands of potholders into this little town of only 5,000 people. And, And that was really my first business. But 
What really set me up, if I answer your question more directly, is scouts. I was in Cub Scouts and then in Boy Scouts. And in Boy Scouts, a Boy Scout learns that he's trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, clean, brave, and reverent. And from my point of view, those are principles that are great to live by personally, but I also think they're amazing principles to to live by every day in your business. And I don't require my employees to learn that, but they all get to hear it from me at least once. And I tell them they can Google it and that sort of thing. But really the, the basics of scouting, uh, treating people the way you'd want to be treated, uh, always doing the right thing. And, and then those principles that I just recited is what really set me up. Yeah. Being a business owner who just tries to imagine being your own client and how you would want to be treated and how you would want to go through that process. And at every step of the way, thinking through things in that way, it's going to make you so much more successful and be able to sleep so much better at night. Yeah, I talk about that a lot. I'm able to lay my head on my pillow every night because I know, I mean, we make mistakes, we're human, but I know how we handle those mistakes. And and I make myself very accessible. You know, people can call and ask for me, my email, my phone number are all published. With 5 million customers, I can still do that because my whole team always tries to do the right thing. You know, as having been a client of yours, you really do have that dialed in. And we'll talk about it a little deeper in the conversation, but I think that from beginning to end, the experience of your customer is different than other places that they can go out and find audio equipment. And I think that the biggest reason, besides just treating everyone well, is a knowledgeable staff. For people who are getting audio equipment, there's so many pieces to the puzzle, and there's so many questions, and there's so many options. And to have a knowledgeable staff there that can walk you through that. It will, will take the time to walk you through it. will reach out and try and help you walk through it um, is different than you find in almost any other customer service experience. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we talk all the time around here. It's not about the the transaction. It's not about making the one sale. It's about always doing the right thing for the customer. And if you do the right thing for the customer or the right things for the customer, Ultimately, the money does come in, but but probably even more importantly, you get repeat business, you get referral business and all those sort of things. But I'm never, ever, ever worried about this one particular sale or transaction. I'm worried about long term doing the right thing for the customer always. Absolutely. So after you were touring as a musician for a while, you decided to come back to what was your hometown and still is Fort Wayne, Indiana. And you began uh, kind of recording music for other people. And you did it in an interesting space, not exactly what one would expect for a recording studio. And I wonder if you could explain that a little bit. Sure. When I was in high school, uh, my mom and dad gave me their VW bus, 1966 VW bus. And that was my first vehicle for, for driving my junior and senior year of high school. I might add that I got the bus when I was 15. In Indiana, you needed to be 16 to drive. So I had about a year to work on the bus. And thankfully, I had that year because my mom had wrecked it. And uh, I ended up filling the front end of the bus with two gallons of Bondo, <laughs> uh, lots of filing and sanding. And then I put uh, headlights on from Tractor Supply, which looked like big bug lights because oh the lights had been smashed out. Yeah. And I spray painted the bus, honest to goodness, with 99 cent cans of, of spray paint, blue spray paint from Kmart. And that was my vehicle. I drove my junior and senior year of high school. And frankly, that's all I had to start ultimately the company with and, and all that sort of thing. But I took that bus on the road after being uh, – through a lot of music classes in high school and thinking I would go play music for a year or so. And then I would come back and go on to college. But after I went on the road as a musician with that bus and the music was bubbling in your, in your blood, it's hard to think about doing anything else. So I played on the road for several years. I play saxophone keyboards and I was always the technical one in the band. And, and back in the late seventies, a lot of recordings happened in, in uh, radio stations. There weren't many recording studios yet. And on the road as a musician, you would go into the local radio station and record commercials and occasionally record, you know, songs or even an album, that sort of thing. And I was always the one that was technical and knew how to do that. Through the several years on the road, I started acquiring a little bit of equipment. Uh, I started making some equipment. I taught myself uh, how to do electronic repair and that sort of thing. And after living in a suitcase and, and out of the VW bus for many years, I finally decided to come back. And, and you're right. I, all I really had was a little bit of equipment in the VW bus. And uh, I would take that bus alongside the local nightclub, the school, the church, you know, whatever it was. And I'd 
pull the bus alongside and I'd run 100 feet or 200 feet of microphone cables in and I would mic up the band or the choir or the preacher or the speaker. And then I'd go back out to the bus and with headphones. And back in those days, it was done on a reel-to-reel tape recorder. So I had a four-channel reel-to-reel tape recorder. And I would sit in the bus with my headphones and record whatever the performance was, whether it was a musical performance or a business presentation or speech and that sort of thing. Then I would take those recordings from my VW bus to my very modest 12 by 55 foot mobile home. And that's where I would edit them and, and put reverb and compression and try and make the recordings better. And my goal was always to make the recordings better than what the customer had paid for. I always wanted to offer a little extra, whether that was a little bit of free time, whether that was additional copies, whether that was me editing them longer and harder. I always wanted to offer what they call down South land yap and provide extra value. Yeah, absolutely. To this day, that's what we do nearly 40 years, well, it's 40 years this past month. Four wow. years later, we still provide extra land yap on almost everything we sell. <laughs> As a business owner, you had it right there from the beginning, right? A little extra land yap for every single scenario. But just to walk through for younger listeners, like I'm in my 40s, I could walk through that process in my mind with you and understand what you were doing. But for a younger listener, just to think about all the elements of the recording process that you just described started with the reel-to-reel recording in the bus itself, obviously with all the mic set up and all the things that come with setting up the sound that gets it to the reel-to-reel recording. Then you go back to your space, and you said you added EQ and compression and things like that as if it was not a big deal. But each of those elements are a different piece of equipment. The process has to go through, the tape has to go through those different pieces of equipment to affect the EQ, to affect the compression, all that kind of stuff, and ultimately ends up on another tape? Yeah, that's exactly what would happen. And uh, it's a lot different today now that we do it all digitally and all on the computer. But you're absolutely correct. Every one of those channels out of the tape recorder had to go through another mixer or a compressor channel or reverb or whatever I did. And then you would mix them to another or an additional final tape. It's just a little different process than what we do today. And uh, But frankly, it still was music. That's what's so awesome about the business I'm in. Whether you're recording it onto a cassette tape or state-of-the-art digital system today, hopefully the song and the music comes through in spite of or regardless of what the medium is that you're recording it on. The song will carry a lot of stuff. But as an audio nerd, and I know you kind of said that you were in that realm too, I I don't want to get too deep into it because obviously a lot of listeners are not as into audio as I am and as you are, but just to imagine all the levels of work that things had to go through that are now just right in your digital audio workspace on your computer now when you're recording and you can just do with a click of a button. So such a different experience. I had cobbled together tens of thousands of dollars of equipment back then. But if you really wanted a professional recording studio back in the in the very late 70s, early 80s, it wouldn't be unusual to spend maybe a half a million dollars on your mixing console and your tape recorder and doing your room and all that. And you'd still have limits to the number of channels you could have. You'd have technical limits and all that sort of thing. Today, Literally for free on in Apple products, you can get GarageBand that has more capability, sounds better, unlimited tracks, all that sort of. And you can do the same thing on Windows machines too. But but that technology today is just so 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 much more affordable. So there's obviously a ton of wonderful stuff about where technology is now when it comes to audio recording. Is there anything you think that young artists are missing out on because of how music has evolved? Well, I think sometimes. Look, there's pluses and there's minuses. I think it's great that you can have this great equipment available and you can do it anywhere, literally in your bedroom, on a bus, at a restaurant. You can be recording onto your laptop or iPads or whatever you have. And sometimes I think younger or more modern musicians miss out on the opportunity of playing with others as much. In the past, when, we, when I started, you had to be in a band or you had to have other fellow musicians because you had to record a lot of this stuff at the same time. There's something, there's some magic that happens when you have a live recording. The interaction with the musicians is more than you'll ever get when you're trying to just piece it together. On the other hand, if you just piece it together, you have the ability to make things perfect and go back and do parts over and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a balance, but I have to tell you, I still would love to hear a, a live recording or a, even a live concert 
of music than a very sterile, dry, highly edited recording of something. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. It's back to the fact that the music is the, really the heart of the thing, no matter what we're talking about. And if you can be right there and present for that, it's always going to have a, a different vibe and a different feel, right? Yep. But I would add up to what you said. What I think is amazing that these tools are so powerful today and they've become so affordable that they're getting into the hands of many, many, many more people. And so we have the advantage of hearing a lot more music. Some of it's really great. Some of it probably is not so good. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's up to the musician and the artist. And, and I think we have lots more choices today. It's actually put the, the power into the hands of the musicians. Where when I grew up, you know, from the probably the 90s back, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, and 50s, the power was in the recording company or the recording label. And now it's really back in the hands of the musicians. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's totally true. You're hearing musicians come up through YouTube instead of a record label or all, all kinds of things like that. Absolutely. They have they have tools and, and marketing abilities today that just were not available even a few years ago. So while you were doing this recording, you were, you know, doing all the things we just described, and then you got your hands on a, a certain kind of synthesizer, a Kurzweil K250 synthesizer. Can you talk a little bit about what the magic was there when you connected with that piece of equipment? Absolutely. Uh, 1984, a good friend of mine owned a local music store, and he invited me to go along with him to what's called the NAM show, which is stands for the National Association of Music Merchants. And uh, that show was in Chicago. And so I went along as his guest and I got to see a prototype. And it really was just a prototype of the Kurzweil K250. And what was interesting about the Kurzweil K250 in 1983 and 84 was that it was the first synthesizer that played back digital recordings of other instruments. Up until that point, we had electric pianos, we had organs, we had synthesizers, but this played back digital recordings of a nine-foot grand piano, of a 50-voice choir, a 30-piece string section. It was the first time you could record a sound from something else, and it was kind of in a synthesizer, so when you hit a key, it was the best digital sound of that key on something else. That's correct. And today we can do that on an iPad and an iPhone. You know, we can sample and play back. But in the 80s, that just wasn't possible yet. And and I saw the prototype and what they positioned it as is it had a grand piano plus 39 other sounds. And at that same time in my recording studio, I had since moved from my mobile home to a very, very small, about a two car garage studio that I had built. And I had a small grand piano. And I thought, boy, if I could replace my grand piano with this Kurzweil K250, not only would I have a piano sound, and by the way, a piano sound that was always in tune because it was digital and never would go out of tune, yeah. but I would have 39 other sounds. So at the end of the recording sessions, I could tell my customers would, or ask my customers, would you like to hear your music with a 50 voice choir or an upright bass or something along those lines? It was a way for me to add, again, a little lanyap or a little extra for them. It also allowed me to have additional billing time in the studio. And so I sold my grand piano and, and I jumped in early with this Kurzweil K250 and bought one and brought it back to Fort Wayne you know, to use in our recording studio. It really changed my life because as soon as I got it back, I started developing my own sounds for it. I'd already been recording for many years and I figured out how you could record sounds and store them onto floppy disks back then that you could load in and out of the Kurzweil. I became kind of the expert around the country. I knew more about the Kurzweil K250 than virtually anyone else. And the people that owned them were really famous musicians like Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton and Stevie Wonder. And uh, I became friends with a lot of those artists and they would ask me to come out and help them with their Kurzweils. They would ask me for my sounds and it didn't take very long. And Stevie Wonder was giving me credits on one of his albums for some of the soundware that I had developed. And uh, I started working on new software for it to make it do things that it didn't do from the factory. And it really changed my business because all of a sudden now, in addition to being a recording studio, I'm helping my friends all over the country with their Kurzweils. And at that time, there were about 350 of these Kurzweils. Eventually, there was about 4,000. But uh, but I'm helping my friends with it. And I'll never forget the day I got a call from a friend that I'd help him with his. And he wanted to buy another Kurzweil. And he wanted to know if I could get him one. And I wasn't a dealer yet. I'd been helping with parts and you know add-ons and that sort of thing. But you know, I asked him, why does he want another one? And he explained to me that he wanted to recreate all the sounds of an orchestra and having a second one would help him do that. And soon some of these musicians wanted extra ones to put in their green rooms or in their buses or at their lake cottages. And 
I became a dealer for Kurzweil's and I started selling this very, very expensive synthesizer. That changed my business from being just a recording studio to now helping my friends with their Kurzweil K250. So it was just an organic evolution from you being curious about something and then digging really deep into it because you thought it was so cool for your own process, for your own studio, and then just becoming an expert and sharing that with other people in a really giving way. Like at first you're, you're just doing it to help other people. And of course you continued to do it for other people, but then a light bulb goes off and it's like, wow, I know so much about this that I could begin to become a part of the process of selling it, of being a dealer of that particular type of piece of equipment. And of course you can, because it's a great type of piece of equipment. It's right where you want to go anyway. So it's like the perfect combination of finding a way to make money and, and helping people, right? Absolutely. The funny story is, at first, you know, I only wanted to make sounds for it and talk to other Kurzweil owners so they would give me their sounds. I was hoping to trade sounds. I quickly found out that I was the more technical person. They were probably much better musicians and that sort of thing. So they weren't as much into the technology and they didn't have as many sounds. And I kind of got annoyed that I do all this work and I just give them the discs, I give them the sounds. And after a little while of just giving the sounds and realizing how busy I was, I started charging a nominal $5 a disc. <laughs> <laughs> and right. that's how humble it all started. Huh. And and as that relationship with my friends happened, uh, the next thing they started calling me. And I, again, I remember the calls. And I understand you can do sheet music on the computer. That was one of the first calls I got. And I said, yeah, I know how to do that. I do that in my own studio. And so I became a dealer for the music software that would allow you to play into your keyboard, but have it display notes on the screen as sheet music. So I started selling that and then they wanted recording equipment. So I became a dealer for some of that reel to reel tape recorders. At that point, 1990, 91, my business had changed from being just a recording studio to now I had five people working for me operating out of my home. And uh, we were selling equipment to thousands of customers all over the United States that were all my friends, quote unquote. And so I think the lesson there for someone who's starting a business or considering starting a business is what do you love? You know, what are you into? What what where's your passions lie? And then dig deep into that and find a way to share it with other people and see where that goes. Now, that doesn't necessarily always work for everyone, but it, it is the story behind a lot of healthy, profitable businesses is the one you just told, which was I found something I loved. I learned everything I could about it. And then I just started sharing it with people. And I went from there. And it sounds very much like that's what started the whole thing that's become now Sweetwater Sound. I just told somebody this morning that, you know, I'm so thankful. We've been in business for 40 years now, 40 years. I could have never believed starting in a VW bus, but I feel like I've never worked a day in my life. I love what I do. I love what I've been able to do. I have no intentions of quitting because I love what I do. Why would you quit something you love doing? And I'm just incredibly thankful. And, and like you said, not everyone gets that opportunity, um, but I'm just thankful that for 40 years, I've been able to help others fulfill their dreams. And, and that's just so, so gratifying. And the other thing that you sort of alluded to, I didn't get into this because I thought I would make money, get rich, all that sort of stuff. I did it because I loved helping others. I loved doing that land yap, giving back a little extra. And it's, it goes all the way back to the roots of being a Boy Scout and being helpful. And I'm just thankful the money happened to come, but that never was my driver and frankly, still not my driver today. So we fast forward to today. You've grown Sweetwater Sound into the single largest retailer of musical instruments and equipment in the United States. If you had to boil down what you've learned over these years, what might be this, and maybe you already said it, but you know, what might be the single most important thing that helped you get to where you're at right now? Sure. And, and just to be clear, we're the largest online. Nobody sells more equipment online than us. I think we're actually the second largest there is a, a chain of stores called Guitar Center that used to be publicly traded, and they're still a little bit bigger than we are, but we sell much, much more online, and that's where the business is clearly growing. The, the real thing is, is the customer service, and those are easy, trite words to say, but when your company from the top down not just says it, but speaks it and does it every day, um, it, it's the real thing. You know, It's not idle words. We do absolutely positively whatever it takes to do the right thing for the customer and treat people the way I'd want to be treated. I can't tell you how many times an instrument's been long out of warranty from the manufacturer, but I still think it's not fair to the customer that it has a problem. You know, it's been in multiple times or whatever. We just replace it. We just do the right thing. If we make a mistake as a human, we fix it. We do the right thing. 
you know, if you boil down to more nuts and bolts, it's the model of business, the way we do business. And we have what are called sales engineers. We have about 400 sales engineers today out of a total of about 1,700 employees. Uh, but those sales engineers work the same way I worked in the early days. I have one-on-one -on -one relationships or they have one-on-one -on -one relationships uh, with their friends, with their customers. And uh, they talk to their customers every day, every week, every month, at least twice a year, depending on the customer's interests and buying patterns and, and those sorts of things. But our sales engineers are seriously, seriously trained. They, uh, they come to us usually with a four-year music technology degree or a lot of experience. And then we put them through 13 weeks, of what we call Sweetwater University. And so before they ever talk to a customer, uh, they go through 13 weeks, 300 classes taught by 80 different teachers. They learn how to work our systems. They learn how to develop relationships with people. And they then learn a little bit more about technology that maybe they're not up to speed on or something. And then at that point, they're empowered to talk to customers. But I don't let them talk to a customer until they've been through all that training because we believe that everyone in our company, from the receptionist to people in the warehouse and everywhere in between, everyone has the ability to add credibility to our company or take credibility away. And of course, we've worked so hard for our brand that we would hate to have someone take credibility away. And so we just make sure they're really trained before they're involved with customers. I love that. Everyone has the ability to add credibility or take credibility away. I think about that a lot as I, as a, a small business owner with five or six employees just trying to figure out how to make sure. And in the, I, I put that on me. You know, that's on me for in, in, the, uh, in the hiring process. That's on me in the training process. Obviously, you have to trust your team and make sure that they do things well. But at the same time, it's really on us to hire the people that fit the situation and to train them in a way that they can add value rather than taking it away. Absolutely. Cool. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the industry that you're in. And really, you're in two industries, in my mind. You're in the music industry and you're in the retail industry. And so I have a couple of conversations to have around both of those things. Does that sound all right? Sounds perfect to me. All right. Scratch Entrepreneur is brought to you by Shine Insurance. At Shine, our goal is simple, to change the way you feel about insurance. Start that evolution today at shineinsurance.com. Hey, we are back with Chuck Surak of Sweetwater Sound. He's built a business over the last 40 years for, with audio equipment. Uh, they retail sell audio equipment online. And uh, Chuck, thank you so much for being with us. I'm happy to be here. So let's start with the music industry before we dig into online retail. What are some of the trends that you're seeing in the world of audio? Maybe like what's jumping off your shelf uh, in your space? It's an interesting mix, you know, at the macro level and the micro level. In some ways, it's the same as it's always been. We are selling lots of guitars, lots of uh, traditional instruments. Yet, on the other hand, technology is getting better. It's getting less expensive. Uh, it sounds phenomenal and it's affordable to so many people today. It's a combination of, of recording equipment that you can now do on your computer, or desktop or laptop, whatever you have. Um, but then there's something about having an old school, whether it's old school literally or just in its sound, but an old school amplifier that I, uh, you know, run my guitar through or whatever. You still, if you have a guitar and if you play guitar, you still have to mic that amp. You know, I mean, I guess you could plug it straight into your computer, but it seems like you're always going to get a beefier sound out of miking an amp and running it through just like folks did 50, 60, even 70 years ago. Actually, you can do both. You can run it through an old school amp, even if it's a modern amp. A lot of the amps today are designed off of old designs. But you're, you're also right that you can plug your guitar right into a computer interface today. And there's all kinds of software programs that will now emulate old amps and they're getting better all the time. And so, you know, depending whether you're playing on stage or, you know, in a big concert hall or a smaller church or in your bedroom, there's so many different tools that are available. And that's what I just love. It's really made the, the power of music being accessible to, to anyone, no matter what your budget is today. 
Yeah, it really is cool. So you mentioned the NAM show that you went to uh, at the very beginning of your Sweetwater Sound experience. And I've been to the NAM show, and it obviously has grown into a much bigger event. But for those folks who have never been to this show, it's really all the music merchants, maybe not all, obviously, but so many music merchants from around the world come together into a conference space. The one in Anaheim is in just like the biggest conference center I've ever been in. And like thousands and thousands and thousands of shops, you know, from small guitar makers to Paul Reed Smith and Fender and Gibson and and all the biggest makers. And so all this stuff comes together into one space. And for anyone who loves music or loves audio, it is like Disneyland. It's just the coolest experience there. I know you've been part of uh, the board of directors of NAM before. I don't really have a question here. I just got excited about NAM. How have you, I guess, how have you seen NAM kind of change over the years? Sure. Well, I think you hit it on the head. It's gotten much, much bigger, and it actually drives the Anaheim Convention Center uh, to get bigger. I've, I've now been involved long enough to see multiple expansions of the convention center. You're right. More than 100,000 people come from around the world. A couple thousand different manufacturers show up and it's a four day. Actually, it, that's what the conventions open, but it's usually the couple days before and after of the vendors showing their wares and, and, and showing us uh, people that sell them what the new stuff they have is. Um, but the technologies have gotten uh, so much more affordable that there are lots of people today that make speakers and lots of people that make microphones and lots of people that make computer software. In the old days, There'd be one company specializing in amps and another company specializing in speakers. But but today, it seems like a lot of manufacturers are making a lot of the same things, but with their own twist to them. And that gives lots of choices to us as the retailer of which products we want to sell, which ones we believe in. But most importantly, it gives the customer choices. And if you don't like brand X, you can buy brand Y. If you don't like brand Y, brand Z probably has something kind of similar. Uh, the show has also changed from in the early days, it was a lot of traditional instruments, guitars, bass, drums, even woodwind and brass instruments, stringed instruments, and very little technology. Today, I would tell you it's much, much more a technology show, although the woodwinds and brass are still there, but it's probably 70% technology and 30% acoustic. Yeah, a few years ago when when we went the uh, DJ section, for example, DJ equipment was, you know, one or two booths. It was significant. It was there, but it wasn't huge. And then this year it was like more than a football field of different types of DJ equipment and stuff like that. So it's a really nice way to know where the music industry is going to just by walking the halls of this uh, show. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the retail industry and and particularly online retail. There's this Amazon out there and it seems like they're really monopolizing a lot of retail and you're seeing a lot of retail struggle from your position. How does Amazon affect your business and maybe online retail as a whole? You know, if we go back to the beginning of retail in general, there have always been various challenges and and threats. And and whether that's when Sears came out with their first catalog way back, and I don't know when they came out with the catalog, to other mail order companies, you know, and specifically even in our industry, there have always been threats. And, and even the threat of I can get in my vehicle and drive to the next state over because the person over there is – you know, offering something better or lower price or, or whatever. Clearly, Amazon's one of the biggest. And I feel very fortunate, I'd even use the word blessed, that our model does not really compete so much with them. And let me try to explain that a little bit. There's there's 5,000 music stores across the United States, and some of them are just great, great stores. I'd never want to talk bad about a competitor. But I will tell you, at those 5,000 stores, they generally have lower wage employees. They don't have the diversity of brands that we're able to have because they don't do the volume of business that we have. You know, we do so much business that I can afford to stock most of the brands and stock pretty deep. I've already told you how we train our salespeople and and we have some real advantages compared to the local store. And I don't mean that disrespectful. I, again, the stores work really hard to do what they do. On the other hand, you have Amazon, who is phenomenal at getting it to you at Amazon Prime in two days, and soon they're going to get it to you in two hours, or they're going to train you to come pick it up at their store, which I think is kind of funny. They kind of put stores out of business in some ways, but then they're going to open their own stores where you go pick stuff up, or they'll deliver it by a drone and, you know, all that sort of stuff. They're really good at that. 
But what you can't do with Amazon is call them up and say, I want to use my Apple computer with Market Unicorn software, a PreSonus interface, and I want to plug my Gibson Les Paul into it. You can't call Amazon and talk to anybody. Our model allows that sort of thing. We, we thrive on having relationships with our customers, as we talked about earlier. And we've not really been threatened by Amazon. And I f- don't think they're willing to invest in the people and the training and all that. They don't really want to have that expense of, of the labor. They want everything to be electronic and online, so on and so forth. But we fit neatly. That's my real story. We fit neatly between the traditional music store and Amazon. And because of that, We've been growing like crazy, even the size we are today. We did $725 million last year, and and we're growing about 20% a year. And as the numbers get bigger, to continue growing by that amount is pretty phenomenal. And that puts us only a couple years away from being a billion-dollar company. And not, not that that's a goal or anything. It's really, again, I'm not driven by the money. I'm driven by doing the right thing for the customer. And it seems like we keep on growing. And Again, we just fit neatly in that model and aren't particularly threatened by them. What I would say as advice, there are lots and lots of things that Amazon does not do well. And the last thing I would ever want to do is try and compete directly with Amazon. And frankly, I wouldn't want to compete with Guitar Center. And I, I respect what they do, but I would want to find a way to zig when they zag. And, and you know, a, a local or a smaller store, no matter what industry they're in, they need to capitalize and focus on what they're really good at or what their strength is. They need to figure out what their difference is and focus on that in a way that Amazon could never do that. And whether that's giving lessons, whether that's personalized service, deliveries, all those sorts of things, there's a lot of stuff Amazon cannot do well. When it comes to the key to retail is the first one is have a service element. Well, maybe the first one is have a niche. Have that thing you do really well. You're not trying to sell everything. You're trying to connect with people on their audio equipment and their musical instruments. So be specific about what you're doing and be specific in a space that you have passion around and know your stuff around. So that seemed like number one from what you just said. And two, even if you are a products-based business, have a service element. Be able to serve the people who are considering purchasing your products because that's something that these, you know, that the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world are never going to be able to do and never going to want to do. They want to commoditize the product and that's fine for them to do. But if we're on the other side saying, look, we're going to serve you and we we know the topic that that is going on here, then you're always going to have a space in, in the game. You're always going to be something that people come to because we all want to talk with someone who knows the thing we're confused about. If it Whether it's shampoo or hair products or audio equipment and guitars, if you have someone to help you with it, it really does help. You know, what I'd say is you have to find a way to add value. You have to be what we call around here the sweetwater difference. And you have to be very intentional and know what that is. I have a bunch of other businesses and every one of them have competitors But I will tell you, every one of my other businesses are doing really, really well because we're very intentional in in understanding and, frankly, capitalizing on what our differences and what our strengths are. And we never, ever, ever try and chase someone because if you try and chase someone, you're always behind them. And I'd rather be the leader. I'd rather be out in front. I wondered what you thought about the relationship with this Amazon thing, and, and you just described it so well, and, and you're so right. So thanks so much for, for opening my eyes and our listeners' eyes to you know how to do that right. Okay, we're going to take another one more quick break. And when we come back, uh, Chuck, I just have a couple more questions for you, specifically about running a business, some insights that maybe you have for our listeners on the, the process of running a business. Does that sound good? Sounds great to me. Cool. Hey, just a quick ad for Shine Insurance here. So we're talking on this episode about audio equipment, and it brings up a topic on the insurance side that comes up a lot, and that is like vintage things, maybe a 1967 Les Paul or even an old classic car or vintage jewelry. Things that are vintage sometimes don't have the best coverage on your insurance policy. Often your homeowner's insurance policy is where you would find some coverage, but not very good coverage. And if so, if you have some of those things, vintage guitars, Uh, classic vehicles or old jewelry, that's something to talk to your insurance agent about. You wanna get a policy that has agreed value coverage. That's agreed value coverage. If you'd like to talk to us at Shine about any of those kinds of things, of course, we're happy to help. Check us out at shineinsurance.com. Now, back to our conversation. (music) 
All right, we're back with Chuck Sirak from Sweetwater Sound. He described a little bit of his history and the evolution of Sweetwater. Then we talked retail business and the music business. And now I want to dig just into a little bit of insight about owning a business. Chuck, you own Sweetwater Sound is the big one, but you own, what, five or six different businesses? Oh, don't tell my wife, but I think it's more like 11 or 12. I, I'm losing track of them, actually. <laughs> In all different kinds of industries, too, right? You, I mean, from aviation to cars to, um, I think, even insurance. Uh, there's some different stuff you got going on, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even even eyeglasses. <laughs> so it's all over the map. And and what I would tell you, although the, they're all different, what is common to all of them is the whole customer service thing. And you know, every one of my businesses, some are named Sweet variations of, of the Sweetwater name, some are not, but every one of them are founded on the principle of just taking care of the customer, doing the right thing. Did you start all your businesses from scratch or did you buy some of them? Uh, about half and half. Some I acquired because they were, there was some unusual story or they were in a desperation sort of mode, not doing so well. And a few of them I've started from scratch. So for folks who are considering picking up a business, um, maybe that's not the right way to frame it, but, you know, thinking about buying into a business, taking a business that maybe isn't doing well and taking over and bringing your own life to it, what makes a good purchase? Oh, that's a good question. I'm still trying to figure that out some days. Um, but you clearly want a business that has good bones and and. You know, all the businesses that I'm in obviously are ethically strong businesses. You know, if, if you're buying a business because it's distressed, you have to look at why is it distressed and is there a difference you can make or or maybe there's just a really strong competitor or some other reason um, that it would be hard to, to get it recovered. I've been fortunate of all the businesses I've acquired. Um, I've turned them all around if they were a turnaround prospect. I've never had to close a business. I hate to do that, but, you know, if I have to, I will. Usually it's pretty simple. You know, you'd be surprised. It's the basics. It's getting the employees to treat each other first, because if they don't treat each other well, how in the world? And if you don't treat them well, how in the world would you expect them to treat your customers well? But getting them to treat each other well, to treat customers well, sometimes it's as simple as cleaning the store or the business up. It's uh, understanding what your differences are. It's uh, just really applying basics and doing the right thing. So it's kind of a gut feeling. I mean, have you have you turned down opportunities, looked at an opportunity and said, yeah, that's that's not right for me? I have turned down many. I, I get a lot of requests, especially <laughs> in our town. Yeah. And people have seen the success and they want us engaged. And to me, it boils down to there's so many great opportunities. There just aren't enough hours in the day. And, you know, I delegate a lot of stuff, but it's still there's just not enough hours in the day. And so we have to turn opportunities down all the time. Yeah. Okay. Over the course of, of your time as a, a business owner, is there a story that sticks out as a, a tough moment, maybe a moment that taught you something because of the way it went down? I understand the question, and I've been asked similar questions before, and I never have a really good answer for that. You know, I hear all the stories that it's okay to fail, it's okay to go bankrupt, that's how you learn, you get stronger, all that sort of thing. I have a slight, and I know you didn't ask exactly that question, but my philosophy is a little bit different. My philosophy is failure is not an option. There is always a way. And I really mean that. I, I just think so much of it is controlled by your mind. Yeah, sure. There's some things that are outside of your control, but there are always, there's always a way to, to get better. There's always a way to improve. You know, what I would say is you can't stand still. Um, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And I only want to get better. <laughs> One of the stories I would tell you, if you remember back to the recession going on in 2008, 9, and 10, I was on the board of directors of a publicly traded bank and it was a local bank, but publicly traded. And we were having to call people's loans due and uh, because of regulations and all that. And it was a really uncomfortable thing to tell someone who is paying their loan currently, but because we have too much in a particular category that they need to pay their loan now in full. And it put people out of business, it hurt people, so on and so forth. General Motors had filed bankruptcy. Everybody was really worried, you know, and, and, uh, I came back after one of those board meetings from this bank and I assembled at that time all 200 employees in our theater. And, and I sat down in front of the theater in front of all 200 employees. And you have to understand uh, what the recession was feeling like to most of us. And again, this is in the fall. I'll never forget it. And I said to all the employees, as arrogant as this sounds, I'm choosing to not participate in this recession. <laughs> And 
I said, I don't want you looking over your shoulder for a new job. I don't want you worried about your job. I've never laid anybody off. I'm not about to lay anybody off now. What we need to do is continue to buckle down as a team. We need to focus on what our strengths are. We need to figure out the things that we could do more efficiently. And I will tell you at that time, we still had a piece of paper that floated through our company as, as a kind of a workflow sheet on every order. And so we figured out how to go completely paperless up until the very end where the customer gets a receipt, I guess. Um, but we went paperless internally. And that, of course, was efficiency that we gained. Um, we looked at brands of equipment that we were selling that we either had more warranty issues with or more trouble with the vendor. And we chose to not carry some brands at that point. We also looked at an opportunity to bring some brands on that we didn't sell up until then. So we invested in ourselves. And probably the best thing that we did, I was confident enough because failure is not an option, but I was confident enough that as other companies were laying off good people, we were hiring them. And so we continued to hire great people through that 2008, 9, 10 uh, recession and and staffed our company with some just fabulously, fabulously great people. You fast forward to today, we have 40 years uh, under our belt today. And every year of the 40 years, our top line and our bottom line are better than the year before. We drive our business. We don't wait for the phones to ring. And I think it boils down to failure is not an option. There's always a way. I, I love that. I, wa- I wonder if I was thinking as you're describing that process, what your relationship is with risk, too. I think that a metaphor I've heard before is is there's a cup of risk. And the more you pour, the more likely, you know, good things potentially could happen, but the more likely bad things could happen, too. Is there some element of that failure is not an option that creates a different relationship with risk for you than maybe a business owner who thinks a different way. Right. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on that. Um, Of course, most entrepreneurs are more comfortable with risk than the non-entrepreneurs and obviously some of us to higher levels than others, but you have to be able to, to put it on the line or take some risk or frankly, it's pretty hard to be an entrepreneur. I will go a step further and say the more risks you take and then you see success out of them, you have more confidence, which, of course, allows you to take more risks, but it also it gives you the, the ability to, to see more. And, and uh, you know, maybe what would seem like a risk to, to a non-entrepreneur or, or even to my wife and those sort of folks, um, to me, it's pretty obvious I know how to make this work. It's not even a risk to me because I know if I do step A, B, C, and D, if I do all the things that I've talked about, it's not really much of a risk because I know I can turn the business around. I know I can make the business double in sales over a couple of years and that sort of thing. So what might be a risk to others is not necessarily a risk to me. The other thing I would say about entrepreneurs, which I, you know, I'm so thankful for and, and, and fortunate, but most companies that start from an entrepreneur point of view, they get to a certain size and they usually will bring in some additional capital from somewhere, whether it's a bank or maybe even a capital firm. And the very skill set that it takes to, to be able to, you know, have a second mortgage, to have credit cards filled up and all those things you might do that's pretty risky. The very risk that you take as an entrepreneur is probably not the risk that the capital firm or the bank wants you to have when they want you to be a manager of the business. And, and so many businesses get started by the entrepreneur, but when they get in that one to $10 million range, uh, they lose control of the business. The the capital firm brings in some sort of a manager and all that sort of stuff. And that definitely happens a lot in that range. It's it's almost unheard of at a hundred million dollars that the founder is still running the company. And, you know, I'm approaching a billion dollars and I'm not patting myself on the back. I don't mean it that way at all. But what I what I'm really trying to say is I've acknowledged that and I've gotten a little uh, more manager or business oriented, but I've also surrounded myself with great people. So I still am able to dream and take those risks. And then I have really smart people around me that sometimes pull the reality in a little bit for me, but you know, I'm approaching a billion dollars and my wife and I still own the company a hundred percent. We don't have any other shareholders or anyone that we really have to answer to. And, and that's given me the confidence to take what would seem like an extreme risk to others. Yeah. I, I heard you changing the word risk to the word investment a little bit and looking at it that way, where it may be, you know, something going out to start, but you see how it's going to turn into something coming back in. If it's going to help people and it's going to end up being a solid investment, then that's sort of a framework that makes more sense to you and how you handle things. 
Yeah, I don't use the word risk around here because anything's possible and failure is not an option and investment is definitely the word that I use around here. Okay, cool. Last question. So where do you see Sweetwater, uh, Sweetwater Sound specifically 10 years from now? Great question. And, you know, after doing it for 40 years, I, I, I don't know if I could have foreseen uh, 40 years ago where we'd be today. As you get more history behind you, it becomes easier and easier to predict the future a little bit. 10 years from now, we will still be selling music equipment, music production equipment to individuals and, and having uh, relationships. You know, I have relationships that go back 40 years of taking care of my friends. I have no reason to believe I won't be taking care of relationships uh, of people over 50 years. And we're going to keep doing the same thing. We're not looking to diversify. Uh, one of our strengths is staying focused on music products and the recording industry and that sort of thing. Even though our model would work for selling golf clubs, it would work for selling, you know, lots of other things. Our goal is to stay really doing this Anything that's used in a recording studio or on stage or at a church or in a person's home from a music production point of view. And we think the future is really bright. Um, we uh, still are not at a billion dollars. And yet our industry, if you count overhead speakers and amplifiers and music equipment, it's about a $20 billion industry in the United States. And that's before we think about going to Canada or Mexico or even jump the pond and go over to Europe or something. So there's so much business for us in the U.S. We think we're going to keep growing for quite a while. If folks want to find you, it's not very hard to do, but, but if folks want to find you, how can they how can they do so? Yeah, very simply, it can be as simple as Chuck at Sweetwater.com. And they'll see that I answer and return every email that I get. They can easily call the Sweetwater phone number and just ask for me. Um, and I answer my own phone calls. I might get help once in a while, but I do answer my own phone calls. I return every call. And that phone number is 800-222-4700. It's 800-222-4700. And just ask for Chuck. Cool. Cool. Chuck, it's been a privilege and an honor. You've done amazing work over the course of the last 40 years, all around the idea that you want to help people, you want to make the audio world and the world in general a better place. I know you've done amazing things for your community and the greater community at large. So thanks for taking an hour of your time to just share a little bit of what you do and how you do it with Scratch Entrepreneur. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. And I just hope I can help listeners just do a little bit better in their lives. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Special thanks to Chuck Serac for sharing the story of Sweet Water Sound with us today. It was a true pleasure. Contributors to this episode include myself, Jeremy Goodrich. I was the host. Mark Vinton created the music for this episode. Our editors are Christopher Lang and Talia Chakraborty. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Scratch Entrepreneur on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Please go ahead and rate and review the show. It really does help. And then head over to Facebook, go to our Scratch Entrepreneur Facebook group and share what you thought of this episode. What did Chuck say that inspired you? What did he say that maybe you question or you wonder about? What insights are you thinking about and wondering about around being an entrepreneur yourself? All those things can be addressed at the Scratch Entrepreneur Group on Facebook. All right, until the next time, we truly appreciate you listening.